Hi, my name is James Lee, and I am the technical support manager for 16 by 9 Incorporated. We are the exclusive U.S. distributor for Crozeal and Bebop accessories. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the, the basics of map box use, uh, sunshades, and, and accessories of follow focuses. And we're also going to be talking about how to use some of the Bebop zoom controls and features, as well as other accessories. Often I get the question, uh, what is a sunshade or a map box for? Um, most of the time it's, it's a very simple answer. The camera itself actually comes with a sunshade, which in most cases is generally usable for our most applications, and that's if you're going to be doing outdoors or indoors. But the reason why we use a map box is because sunshades themselves do not offer enough protection when we're using the camera around a very bright lighting situation, either indoors, uh, in a studio environment where you have so much studio lighting that you have ambient light coming in from different directions. Um, also, if you're doing outdoor sporting events, uh, if you're near water, you want to be able to control some of the additional light that comes into the camera by using the map box system with the added French flag and the side flag availability, and as well as matting that are available on some of the units. Now, what that really does is it gives you that special ability to actually control some of the additional contrast uh, differences that you get and give you better control overall. Um, the other reason why we have these systems is also to add a little bit of creativity control to it. Uh, it allows you to use filters for the system. Uh, a lot of it is either color filters or neutral density filters, polarizers, uh, any type of uh, filter that will create that special look that you're looking for. And depending on which manufacturer, there are so many different types that you can select from. Uh, your creativity is endless when it comes to using filters. Now, with the way these sunshades are, um, they also limit you very much on using just the focal lens of the camera itself. It doesn't allow you for use of any type of lens attachment, whether it be a telephoto or in other cases, wide angle attachments. Uh, Matte boxes and clip-ons will allow to use, to a certain degree, uh, teleconverters and even wide angles clipped in between the camera, the map box, and the lens itself. Now, to start with, what we'll show you is we offer two different versions. And basically, first we have is what's called the original map box version. These have actually been around for years uh, in film industry use. And these are basically the integration of the sunshade along with filter mechanisms directly mounted to the back of it to allow again, the addition of filters that you can add. Um, in this system here, you can actually see two filters, which is the most common configuration. There are so many other configurations you can get. Uh, for instance, there are single filter units, there are two filter units, and even units you know, that actually allow you to stack on all the way up to six filters if we look at the larger broadcast type series systems. The differences that we have between the two systems, we offer a map box system and basically a clip-on system. Now, for the map box system, basically it allows you to mount and requires the use of rods directly underneath the camera. And this is a standard universal mount that's used in the industry. 15 millimeter basis, uh, mini rod solution. Uh, the other solution that we offer is a clip-on system. Basically, it doesn't require the use of rods, and it mounts directly on front of the lens of the camera using step rings, just as you would use your normal sunshade, again, with the addition of the ability to add filters. We have units that take 4x4, 4x5, 6, 3x3. There are very large variations in different types of filters that are available. Uh, the needs usually come from what effect that you're looking for, uh, what size of filter you're going to be working with or you have available to you. And the other is generally focal length limitations on what you're working with. Uh, for instance, certain cameras, depending on the chip size, require wider map boxes. Others that are much smaller can work with the smaller map box systems that we offer. And that'll also determine what type of filter size is best for you. So here's a, our most popular system, the 45001. Uh, it incorporates one stationary filter stage, which is basically for graduation effect uh, or filters that are solid that you're not going to be using any type of special movement other than just graduation or stationary positions. You have a rotational stage, which allows you to use rotating filters such as polarizers, or if you're going to be using color grads, you could use some color grad control using the rotational capability of the map box. Systems are very simple in the fact that we offer drop-in trays rather than a lot of other systems that are out there which allow you to simply slide in the filter. Now, the advantage to the way these systems work is that the filter is actually encased in a frame which helps control additional light flares coming in from the map box from different locations, whether it be studio lighting or direct sunlight. 
they're basically designed so that you can actually see what type of filters it, it'll fit. For instance, this is our 4x4 stage, which is in the rotating stage most commonly found. It allows you to simply drop in your filter through the front side here using a pull retaining assembly. So you drop in the filter through the front and you let go of the retaining assembly and that'll actually hold in your filter. From there, once you've loaded your filters, you just simply slide it in. And on the side of our systems, we actually have locking knobs, which actually keep the filters from coming free or accidentally dropping if, if you're doing a moving shot or any type of action shot. Now, one of the key things to remember when inserting filters is that the trays are designed a specific way. You'll notice there's an open side and then there's a closed side. Now, the closed side, you want it to be loaded in towards the back of the map box where the lens would normally sit. And the reason we do that is for two reasons. One, it actually opens up the field of view so you don't have uh, vignetting problems with uh, wider lenses if you're on the verge or limits of ma uh, map box limitations. Second is because it also helps to control flares that come off of uh, filters. Now, in a lot of cases, filter manufacturers do put edging on filters, but um, it's not always that you get a perfect filter sometimes, or from general use, you might have some chipping or, or something else that ha happens to the edge of the filters. So if you have the filter tray reversed in the back direction, well, what this does is it opens up the, uh, the capability of actually getting flares into the lens by a stray light hitting the corner of that filter and then bouncing back into your lens. So it's always important to remember to insert the filter tray directly and facing the right direction. And you'll know because when you actually look at the system, the part number will always be facing towards the, the camera operator side. One of the design characteristics that we often get asked about is whether the map box or sunshade that you're looking to purchase or already have will work with the type of format that you're shooting with. In many cases, uh, the map box systems that we offer are multi-format. They will both work for 4x3 or 16x9, but in many cases it's limited to the focal length of the lens, the chip size, and basically the type of map box that you have. For instance here, the 450 system, you'll notice is more of a rectangular shape design, and this was ideally designed for the optical use on 16x9 type cameras like the Z1. Um, however, it is still usable with 4x3. It's just not as well designed for use as in flare protection purposes for 4x3. But it still gives you that flexibility to use the system with 4x3 or 16x9. Now, for instance, our sunshade systems, you notice, actually are a little bit wider. This is actually a larger system, but this is also more designed for 4x3 applications, but can be used for 16x9. So they both interchange and work both ways, just depending on the focal length limitations of the camera that you're using with. Now, one of the main differences that you'll see is actually the opening that we have in the back of the housing is generally tailored towards that format size. As you can see, it's a 4x4 uh, four would normally be much shorter into this filling gap here. This here you're seeing is for 16x9. Now, with this in mind, that also comes back to the filters. Now, filters can be used for different sizes, uh, whether it's 4x4 or 4x5.6, but in many cases, certain filters fit a particular application. Uh, 4x5.6 generally is what we reckon more often for 4x4, uh, for 16x9 type format shooting, uh, depending on the size of the camera and chip size that you're working with. For these smaller cameras, 4x4 generally covers most applications uh, due to the smaller chip size. When you want to go into consideration of larger filters is if you start stepping up to larger chip size cameras. Um, that will determine how wide of a field of view and the type of lenses that you're going to be working with. Now this system here alone will take two 4x4s, which is enough to cover majority of cameras, uh, whether it's the HVX200 or the Z1. Now the consideration why we have a, a wider uh, stage in the front here is mainly because of a lens attachments. If you decide to go with a wide angle, sometimes just that step out will actually cause a little bit of vignetting, so you might want to step up to a 4x5.6 filter in that application. Now, the other uh, type you can use is 4x5.6 verticals, and those are more designed for if you're looking for quite a bit of graduation. Uh, generally, 4x4s are going to be the most common filters and the most available, whether it be for purchase or for rentals. Uh, they're the most common size found in the industry next to 4x5.6 filters. Uh, on these systems, we do actually offer combination stages, like this particular stage here found in our 450 system is designed uh, to actually accept both 4x5.6 and 4x4 filters. And the way you can tell basically is we actually have two set points here which indicate where the filter should be seated. 
Um, they're actually fairly simple and they'll keep you from misaligning the filters. So what you'll do is with the, withholding the filters by its edge, you'll actually seat it between the first two teeth and you'll actually feel it drop into position. From there, you pull the retaining assembly up, lay it against the flat frame, and release the retaining assembly. From there, this will actually keep the filter from moving and sliding out of position. And with this, now you can see the gapping availability that shows where the 4x5-6 would normally fit. And simply insert back into your map box. And you want to lock it down using the side locking assembly. And now you have your 4x4 seated into the front assembly. To mount the filter into a 4x4 stage, this is actually our most common size stage that we have in our systems, you simply remove the tray, you grab your filters by the edges, you'll drop the edges directly right into the teeth of, of the tray. With the tray tilted angle, you put, hold on to it, pull the retaining tab, and the filter drops into position. Simply to mount this filter holder in, make sure that you're inserting it in the proper direction. The part number is always facing the operator side of the map box. Simply slide the unit into position, expose the locking knob, and rotate to lock it into position. From here, this will keep your filter stage from dropping through. The rotation that you see in the movement of this system is really designed for use with polarizers, and in other cases, if you're using graduation filters, where you'll slightly graduate to meet a horizon or a skyline and graduate your filter from there. Now, to show what's different on this map box, we actually have a ring that's already pre-mounted into here. A lot of our systems come with a standard diameter size opening. The 450 system basically comes with 110 millimeter size opening to adapt basically to telephotos and such down onto smaller sizes. Simply unscrew the, the ring, as you see here, and choose your substitute ring for either the lens attachment that you're using or a different camera, and simply screw right back in. This allows you to create a light baffle to prevent any type of light leaks coming in from the back of the camera. Now, on some of the systems, you'll notice that we actually include a front mask mounted into here. Uh, not a lot of people are aware that you can actually remove this, and there's actually a purpose behind this mask that's inserted. When inserted, it actually reduces the opening of the front of the map box to create uh, more light control so you don't have any type of light leaks coming in when you're not using for uh, wide-angle attachments or such. As you can see, it's already creating a shadow effect on the inside of the box. And this comes in very useful when you're using in very bright light conditions. Uh, again, like for instance, inside a stage or this type of application where we're in an interview and there's a lot of ambient lighting around. Now, in cases where you're gonna be using lens attachments or if you go to a wider camera, uh, you can actually simply pull this unit out and now it opens up the system to allow you uh, for less vignetting problems, but also to accommodate lens attachments as well. And you'll notice that there are four tabs located within the housing that hold the mask in place. First one being located directly in the bottom here, on the side, on the upper position, and on the opposite side. And simply to unseat it, you simply place it, drop it into the first tab, drop it into the second, directly across, and simply press in the top and bottom, and now it's back into position. One of the most common things you'll come across uh, with using map boxes is the type of rods that are available. There's generally two sizes that are the most common in the industry, and that's either film or video. And the first being a 15 millimeter rod diameter, and the second being a 19 millimeter rod diameter. Now the 19s you generally will not come across unless you're using much heavier film type applications where you need that additional support. The most common that you're gonna find is actually what we call 15 millimeter lightweight support or on-camera rods. Now this actually has 15 millimeter diameter. Uh, this is the most common standard size and allows it to be usable between different manufacturers as long as they follow the standard norm of rod size diameters. Now this is a design that was designed for the Panasonic's uh, SDX and HDX type camcorders. Uh, we do offer quite a variety of type of cameras and in this particular version this is actually designed to mount and replace the front toe assembly of the camera still allowing to use the camera plate system uh, the locking plates that are supplied by the manufacturer for the tripods, but incorporates the mounting assembly to attach the 15 millimeter rods too. From here, just to show you, the rods are actually made out of aluminum, they're very lightweight, removable, 
And you can actually cut these down to size for specific needs. For instance, if your own camera operator or if you own a rental house, sometimes you'll have multiple sizes. And that's more tailored towards the type of lens system that you're going to use to, to mate the map box to the appropriate lens length. In certain cases, you may need to extend the rods, in which case all of our rods actually have threaded extension holes into them. Now, the threaded holes will accept two types of extensions that we offer. The first is a 50 millimeter extension, which is approximately two, mil, uh, two inches in length, and simply thread in directly to the front, extending the rods an additional two inches. As you can see, it gives you a nice, smooth transition so that when you slide on your rods for uh, map boxes or follow ups it'll fit very easily. The second type of extension that we offer is a 100 millimeter extension, which is approximately four inch extension on the rods. Now, the reason why we have the longer sizes is also to accommodate, for instance, when you attach a tele teleconverter to your camera or a wide angle attachment. In cases where full size rods like this, uh, the length is non-adjustable. Uh, so you would actually have to screw this in to accommodate the additional length that's created when adding attachments directly in front of the lenses. So with the four inch extensions on, as you can see, it's quite a bit of an extension that now exists within the front rod system when screwed in. Now, the design, uh, you can actually find rods in different sizes. Aluminum is the choice of Crozeal, mainly because of the fact that you can customize the length, but also because it is a very strong, rigid type system, which, which allows for a good rigid mount when adding additional weight for map boxes, or if you're supporting uh, lens brace, or even sometimes using servos for focusing or zooming. Um, this is our newest DV support that we offer for the small DV cameras, which is included with all the kits that we offer. Um, this is also available for individual purchase for upgrades for existing Mapbox systems. Now, the base plate on this system is universal, meaning the same base is used for all of the different cameras, whether it be a Canon, uh, a Sony, or a Panasonic camcorder. The main difference that we offer now is different top plate assemblies with risers that mount in between to change the position of the platform where the camera actually mounts onto. Directly under the support, you'll actually find a sliding nut that we've integrated into the system to allow for helping to balance the camera when attaching to either your tripod head or the quick release on the tripod itself. Now, in the hole, you'll see a quarter, a quarter 20 in here and a 3 8 And when delivered, we actually include it with a quarter 20 to 3 8 adapter. So you, if you're using smaller tripod plates, you can actually adapt to those. Now, on the top assembly, you'll notice that in certain cases, depending on the type of plate that you get, there are multiple hole positions and in this position, these are designed to accommodate different types of cameras, and in certain cases to move the camera forward or back. Also integrated that's new are rubber non-slip pads, which were not in our previous designs, which actually help the camera from sliding and moving. Now, integrated into the new system are a single locking rod design, which allow you to adjust the rods to appropriate length. So if you're using the camera stock, let's say you would need to reduce it back so the map box will actually sit in line with the front and allow the rotation of filter without hitting the rods. Now, if you were to add a lens attachment, whether it be a telephoto or a wide-angle converter, you just simply extend the rod length to the appropriate length and lock it down to position. If you need additional, we always have extension rods that can still screw in, as, as in our larger designs. With the extensions mounted, it allows you a longer length to work with any other type of attachment that you may place, whether it be a 35 millimeter adapter or lens attachments such as a teleconverter or wide angle converter. Now to demonstrate how to mount this, we'll show you one of the key features of the system itself. All of the DV supports actually include a little pin, which what we call the keyway guide, the mounting screw, generally a quarter 20, uh, which is a standard for mounting uh, cameras. Now certain cameras will actually include one keyway or two keyway, just depends on the manufacturer. In which case, the keys can actually be removed by simply unscrewing them, allowing you for a very simple adjustment. Now, to show this mounted onto a tripod, it's very simple to do. You simply dismount your camera, You'll remove your plate using a standard flathead screwdriver.
And you'll notice that a pattern appears, which is universal between all digital video cameras, uh, as far as a smaller HDV and DV size. You'll notice that there's one keyway in the actual quarter 20 screw. In the case of the Sony, you'll notice that there's a second keyway to adjust for the long length of the camera. Now, what you will do is you'll actually align the first keyway into this whole assembly here. And when mounted, you just simply guide it into position. And sliding the nut out of the way will expose the slotted screw that's mounted directly underneath. You'll simply take your screwdriver, mount it into position. From there, you have a nice sturdy mount directly underneath. Now from here, you'll actually adapt your quick release plate directly onto the bottom of your lightweight support, uh, depending on the size. And you may have to play around with this to find the, the basic balance center point, mainly because of either lens attachments or the type of mount box that you use. So simply mount this back together. Lock it into position. And you can now mount it back directly onto your tripod. And of course, always make sure that you lock your tripod head into position. Now from here, you can see that the camera is now at a raised platform size. And the reason why it is raised is because it follows a standard film center. In most cases, rod centers for universal lightweight supports go from 50 millimeters center point to 85 millimeters up to the lens center. Now, the, the rod base is a different height from the base of the camera to the rods to meet the optical center of the camera, which is generally located directly at the center of your lens. Now, with this, we'll show you actually how to adjust the matte box to fit the camera in most cases. All of our lightweight supports allow for a certain amount of adjustability, and that's mainly because every camera has a slightly different center sometimes. And in order to do that, you simply mount your rods in. And you'll notice on the lightweight support, there's a little small Allen screw located at the front between the two rods. This is a four millimeter Allen screw, or you can actually use a 5 30 seconds Allen screw. So with this in place, you can actually take your Allen wrench, lock it into the center, and quarter turn will actually release it. And as you'll notice, it actually gives you side to side adjustment and vertical adjustment. And this is to help you center the map box to the optical center of the camera. Now to mount this, to show you, we will actually mount this directly in front, seat it onto the, to the rods. Now as you can see, the centering of the lens is not matching or mating properly to the map box. So what we will do is we'll actually adjust this, moving into the position which will allow you to find the center of the rods. Now once you find your center, you'll take your Allen wrench, lock it into position, and this will allow you to mate your map box directly onto the lens. But the always thing to remember is when you actually mount and lock down the rods, the rods have a tendency to fold forward. So until you lock it down, or if you're hold, until you're holding it perfectly in position, you may not line up centered. So the best thing to do is always hold the map box into place, find your center, hold it from the front, and then lock down your position. And this will enable to, you to mount and slide your camera directly into position there. To center the map box, you'll notice that here in this example, the, the map box is not centered to the lens center. Uh, as you can see, the unit does move side to side and vertically. You'll find your center. And before you do, one thing to do is make sure that the map box sits slightly off your lens so it's not resting on it to hinder your centering of the map box. So once you've found your center position, you'll hold the assembly in place and locking it down into position once you've found your lens center. And slide your map box into position, giving you a nice flush fit against the camera. From there, lock down your rods and you're ready to go. As you can see, in certain cases, um, camera design will actually hinder the operation of the map box. For instance, normally filter trays come directly from the top so that you can actually use them very easily and reach for them easily. However, in cer certain circumstances, like for instance on the Sony Z1, the map box is hindered by the fact that the microphone extends past the lens. 
So what we'll do is actually, instead of mounting directly from the top, we'll actually mount the filters directly from the bottom, thus allowing you to use the filters. Now, once you load in the filters, always make sure that you lock down the locking knobs on, on the side, towards the operator side, and insert your trays. Again, always remember that the open side of the filter tray should always be facing out and the closed side of the tray facing in towards the lens. And once in position, you can now operate your filters directly underneath. In many cases, you'll see actually operators using map box without the French flags. And in other cases, you'll find someone that does. And reasons for that is really it comes down to the type of shooting situation that you're in. For instance, in this environment that we're working now, you'll notice that we do have a lot of light coming into the system. And you can actually see that by looking directly at the front of the map box and noticing the glares that come in through the front. Now, with conjunction of that, you would actually want to use your flags to stop down the light that comes in, taking away that ambient light that comes into the system. And one thing you can do, of course, is if it's provided with a mat to insert the mask directly into the front. And in certain cases, this may not be enough. So in addition to that, we offer the top flag assembly, which simply mount directly to the top bar assembly using the two locking knobs located at the top. Now on the flag, you'll notice that we've actually got indentations mounted directly to the top to indicate where it actually slides into. You'll also notice on the top flags, we do have them mostly in a folding design. With that in mind, you want the flat side always facing down from the map box and the ridged hinge side facing up. So to simply slide in, back off the mounting screws, guide it into the indentations, and then simply close down the knobs again to mount the flag in place. Now, the reason why we have the hinge side up is, again, it gives you a nice, complete, clean fit without allowing for light to leak in through the back. From here, you can actually fold down the flag and depending on your focal length, you'll actually move it to the position that best works to reduce the flare. And as you can see, it already begins to shade the map box from additional flare. Now, even if more control is needed, we do offer the ability on some systems to accept side flags. Now, in the side flags, we do have a very similar design where there is an indentation that always guides where to locate the position. On the pivoting assembly, you'll notice a slot that's been milled directly into the side. In many cases, we have operators that always seem to put it on the outside, which is not the proper mounting procedure as it allows the flag to flop into position. Ideally, you want to take this, this guided indentation slot and mount it directly into the grooved hole and press fit into position. And that should give you a very clean, solid fit. And then using the lock knob, this will pinch the flag in place to keep it from sliding out. From here, we actually have an additional flag assembly which allows you to do a sliding feature here. Now, this is designed to actually meet up with the top flag assembly to give you a nice, clean light fill for either ambient light or directly when closed down to create a much more closed telephoto effect to create better light control in lighting situations. So here, with both sides mounted in, you see the standard design that you see with a lot of our systems. Now to operate it, basically open up your flag, and depending on your shot, where you're zoomed into, you'll actually close down the flags to the position that you need that best suits your flare control problem. Now the flags are also used for certain circumstances, whether it be indoor for studio applications or extreme lighting conditions, but let's say general day use when for instance, you're shooting outdoors and you may have a car that's sitting off to the side or a building where the light reflects off the glass and comes back in. And that's where actually the flags also come in as well. So it's not just for studio lighting or any other type of situation, but general all types of shooting applications. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that we only have three flag configurations here. In certain cases, for extreme conditions, we can actually offer an additional mounting bracket on the bottom which will allow for an additional top flag to be moved to the bottom to give you additional flare control. Now with the addition of the bottom flag, this will actually help to give you additional flare control. For instance, if you're shooting near water, lakes, oceans, a lot of times you might get the reflection coming directly off the ground, coming up towards the lens. With the addition of that bottom flag, you'll actually get that additional control that's needed. Now this type of flag is used to, to mount directly on the top and allows you pivoting up and down to actually close down and help control some of the light that may come in. 
For additional control, we always, of course, offer side flags that can actually be mounted on, which also pivot in and out to give you that additional flare control. Now, mounting a sun shade is very simple and easy. Uh, a lot of our systems basically have a back clamping diameter on the plate, which simply uses a knob to pull in a ring that grabs onto an adapting surface, whether it be a screw-in ring like this 411.14 or a clamping ring like the 411.23. Now, the differences with these rings are that the 411.23, a ring like this type is generally used for professional type video lenses, which already provide a hard clamping surface. Now, for the smaller cameras, however, DV cameras and HDV cameras in general do not have any type of hard clamping surface area, mainly due to the plastic body areas. And you don't want to be clamping onto that because of the fact that you'll actually cause the body to flex. So in order to mount, we'll offer two ways. If you already have an existing 411.23 or similar type of ring for broadcast cameras and you're adapting your system to the smaller cameras, you'll actually use a small ring like this. Now this ring here is marked S1001-73 and what you'll see here is it actually gives you the diameter size. Now this marking indicates the diameter, the size that it starts at, which is this outer surface area, 85 millimeters, and step down to 72 millimeter, uh, M meaning a male thread. So we've got a 72 millimeter male thread on the side and an 85 diameter on here. So with this ring, we'll actually simply screw this directly into the camera. Now once mounted in, this provides a very hard clamping surface compared to trying to clamp directly onto the plastic body. For now from here, you'll use your standard full-size step ring that you take from your full-size camera. Simply snap it into your clip-on system, making sure that you back off the clamping assembly a bit. And now you can see we've reduced this down to 85 millimeter using the standard ring. And then we'll simply take it and slide it over the ring. And you want to align it to make sure that it's perpendicular square to your camera. In general, you'll do this by looking into your screen to make sure when you're at your widest point that you're not vignetting. And then using the lock knob on the side here, simply clamp it down to get a secure snug fit. And now you have your sunshade clipped directly onto the front of the lens. Now another device that uh, comes into question a lot of times is follow focus. Now the follow focus came basically from the film industry when uh, second assistant operators or camera assistants were used to help focus the lens or the specific shot that was being done. In most cases a pre-measured shot going from a point A and point B, measuring from the film plane out to where your talent location was, and then being appropriately marked on the focus, either on the lens of the focus barrel or actually on the follow focus itself. Now, the other f function of a follow focus is to add convenience to it. Now, for different shooting applications, a lot of times it's very difficult to see how you're focusing when the markings are 90 degrees away from the operator sitting behind the camera. With the follow focus, you can transfer the markings directly onto the scale of the follow focus, allowing you to see the scale directly from a 90 degree point angle. Now, with the follow focus, there are quite a few different types. We have, this is actually our most common, which is our DV single-sided follow focus. We also offer a professional version, which is a larger version designed for larger lenses. And we also offer a double-sided version on the larger professional sides to allow for opposite sides of pulling focus from the camera. Now, in many cases, on a small camera like this, you may not need a double-sided follow focus. And because of the small camera size, you generally will not be using a second assistant and also the new shooting styles that come across with these smaller cameras. The reason why we have the single-sided DV follow focus. Now, the follow focuses will change how you focus on your camera using the scales to indicate predetermined measured marks using the indicator and using the white scale using either a grease pen or a pencil to mark in your measured points again from your film plane to your talent location that you're going to be focusing in. Now this will allow you to quickly focus in from let's say if you were to take a position pre-measured out and you mark it and using the indicator here you'll take a pencil or a grease pen and simply mark your pos first position shot move to your second position shot and indicate your second position shot. Now from there, this allows you to simply focus between your two points without having to remeasure back and forth. Now this offers a convenience for an operator, especially when it's difficult sometimes with these smaller cameras to be able to find the right focus point. If it's a predetermined shot, by marking the scales, it makes it very easy for you to hit your marks without being out of focus. Now, 
mounting is very simple to this system, and it basically is designed to fit onto standard 15 millimeter mini rod support. So whether it's a Crozio lightweight support or anybody else's, as long as it's 15 millimeter universal, it will actually mount to that. With this, we actually require the use of gears being mounted to either the camera lens or the follow focus itself. For instance here, currently we do not have a gear mounted into it. Most DV cameras do not come with any type of gear mounting to the system. Full-size cameras actually do have gearing, so in, in which case, it's already preset to go. So for the smaller cameras, we offer solutions such as gear rings that simply slide over the focus barrel, or split ring designs that simply clamp over the barrel to make it very easy to attach your follow focus assembly to. Now, the, the question you see a lot of is what pitch to use when using follow focuses. Now, the, the pitch size that you see here is what we call a 0.8 pitch, which is a standard film pitch. And what that really describes is the distance between each teeth and the, the fine coarseness, or fine or coarseness, of the teeth that you're going to be mating it to. Now, the pitches that you'll find uh, are very different within the video industry and the film industry. Now, for if you're looking at, for instance, larger size lenses found on the professional size cameras, there are gear pitching there, which is different from what we use in the film industry. Now, for the film industry, it's a 0.8 pitch. Whether it's a Fuji or a Canon lens, however, on the video side, you may find a different pitch, which range anywhere from a 0.4 to 0.5 and 0.6. Now to mount geared rings directly to the camera, we have two different styles. One is a solid ring, which is the preferred method. And then we also have split rings, which are generally split in half, designed from a much more softer material, which allows you to flex and slide it over the body with the camera. To mount this type of a system, you'll notice that it's designed as a single solid piece. And for a camera like the Z1 here, we have access to the focus barrel without any intrusion of any other part on the camera. So to mount this, what we'll do is we'll actually simply hold the cam uh, ring in place, simply slide it over the barrel, and press it in evenly all the way around until you feel it stop against the barrel. Now, the rings are designed to where they have a very good fit, precision fit, which doesn't necessarily require locking down. However, if, if an additional security is needed, there are three set screws that are mounted within the body of the gear rings, which allow you to simply screw down and lock into the position against the rubber. And basically, you'll find those located within teeth using a flathead screwdriver. So once mounted, you'll simply slide in evenly, pressing all the way around until you feel it stop against the lens. Now, you want to make sure you have a clean fit pressing all the way around. And the reason for that is to make sure that you have a linear movement when rotating the barrel. As you can see here, without being screwed in, it sits very snugly to the lens. Now from here, you've now provided gear for the lens itself, so you can actually add your follow focus from here. With this in position, the DV follow focus actually simply slides out of position. You'll actually mount it to the rods, unlocking the knob, and then sliding it in. Now, to mate the fall focus to the gear ring that's just been installed, you'll actually need a gear drive to be mounted to the fall focus. Now, we do offer different pitches of gear drives, again, to fit either Fuji or Canon uh, video type lenses. But in the most common cases, the gear rings that we make for the small DV camera is a standard film 0.8 pitch. And we offer different diameter sizes to mate against these gear rings that are supplied. Now, you'll see the shaft that mounts directly into the body. And then you'll notice two pins that are located on the gear drive itself. These were actually keys designed to fit and help you align the gear and to help drive the assembly, making sure that you have no slipping. So simply take your gear, slide it into the front, and as you can see, now rotating, it mates up with the assembly. Now what you'll do is slide it in against the gearing, rotating into position, and locking it in place. Now one of the precautions you want to take is making sure that you do not press too hard against the follow focus when engaging it into the gear ring. You want to be able to have enough movement to where there's no backlash, but still be very smooth. Pressing it in too hard will actually give you a rough movement, which in, in turn generates vibration, which you'll see against the lens of the camera. Now to mount the map box, always remember to mount the follow focus first before the map box. Take your map box, slide it onto the rods, lock the map box onto the rods, once you lock the map box, also make sure that you lock the follow focus into position to keep it from sliding out of position. 
Now, as you can see from the follow focus, you can actually grab it from the side and still operate from behind the camera, pulling your focus using the scale to see. But in certain circumstances, you may need to actually stand a little further away or further back, in which case we off offer different accessories. One, which is a speed crank, which simply just snaps into position, allows you to grab it a little further away and be able to pull your focus. Or two, using an, an extension whip a variable length. We actually have these in different sizes that simply snap in just like the crank does and then simply allows you to be further back operating the focus from the rear position of the camera. In this case, generally, a lot of times you'll see this done for studio applications where you want to be standing behind the camera and being able to pull focus and zoom from the back position. Now, one of the things you may want to do if you're using a whip or any other focusing device from back of the camera is add an external monitor that will allow you to see better for better focusing. So for instance, we offer NOGA arms here that simply screw directly into mounts, either using the quarter 20 thread or using shoe adapters, allowing a surface for a monitor to mount directly onto. From here, simply screwing quarter 20 thread onto the bottom of the monitor. Just a couple of turns, and then you can actually use a locking nut to simply lock the position. The center knob here will actually allow you to release a three-jointed position on the arm, allowing you to position the monitor back or sideways, depending on your shooting preference or style, and allow you to operate using the whip and now the monitor for remote focusing. Now, zoom controls are really designed so that you can actually access your uh, remote functions of the zoom from a different location, whether it be on a pan bar, just as you see here, or on a jib crane application, or even sometimes in a steady cam up application. Now, here we have the product that we represent, which is the Bebob DVXL control. The tension spring used in the system is actually designed to feel as close as possible to a broadcast control. And the crispness that you feel allows you to get that precise control that you, you want to get from rocking the controller back and forth, which is sometimes not always found in all controllers. There are push-button controllers, and then there are rocker controllers and joystick controllers. But this is the most common type of controller that you find. And simply rocking from one position to the other gives you tele or wide. Now, in this controller, we can actually do several functions. And depending on which mode that we actually use this control unit on, it'll actually control two different types of camcorders. Now, one of the most important features that you have to remember about a camcorder is that Every manufacturer uses different types of servo controls in smaller camcorders. Some are a little bit more responsive, others are not. Now, controllers themselves are limited to a certain degree. For instance, one manufacturer may make a controller using cheaper components, others may not. That sometimes does play into the role of the control unit. Also, the fact of the servos being used within the camera and the access to those servos will determine how well of a control that you'll meet. But most of that also takes place with the practice, how often you use controls, how you get used to the responsiveness of the control to be able to control whether you have a smooth start, slow start, and so on. Most small zoom controls connect using a 2.5 millimeter mini stereo jack found on the side of the camera. Directly locating the connection port on your camera, you'll either look for a LANC protocol, which is gonna be a blue colored connector found on most Sony and Canon camcorders, and the camera remote connector found on either the DVX series of camcorders or the HVX series of Panasonic camcorders. Now, once placed in, you'll simply make sure that you mount directly into the camera, turn on your camera to the correct mode, and get into position using your remote control. Now, this application you can see here is designed for ergonomic use. In most cases, an operator generally has to focus and zoom at the same time. And it's quite cumbersome to have to reach in either to reach the zoom rocker on the side of the camera or on the top of the handle, or try to use both the focus and the zoom rings when you're either looking through the viewfinder or the LCD screen. With the remote being moved further back on the pan bar, this allows you a very ergonomic feel to one, be able to control your pan movement of your tripod, still have your thumb on the control and keep your hand on the focus looking through your screen to do your movement shots, either focusing and zooming at the same time. Now, the other application would be for jib applications where you have the camera remotely located, or you'll have the camera up high, and you'll want this 
controller located near the operating position. Now, for our control, we actually have a dual mode version. Now, for instance, you'll notice that we have several buttons and LEDs located on this unit. The LED functions only operate in the lamp mode for all three LEDs. For the Panasonic mode that we offer, only the center record LED functions, the others do not. And the reason for this is mainly because of the way the different manufacturers use their remote zooming protocols. For instance, the LAN control is a software-driven function, so you're actually interfacing software within the camera control functions of the camera, allowing you the use of several different features of the camera. Now, on the Panasonic option, when switched for this unit, it's more of an analog electronic control rather than a software-driven control. So you have very limited functions that are available, meaning you can only use the red LED when this functions. Now, to access the modes on this, there's a switch located directly at the bottom of the unit. Removing it off the pan bar, you'll notice there's a little slide switch located at the bottom of the remote control. Now, on the label itself right next to this, which indicates which side operates length, which side operates DVX or camera mode features. When the switch is pushed to the left, indicated by the L, you are in the Sony LANC protocol. When the switch is pushed to the right, you're in the X mode or indicating the Panasonic's camera remote mode or DVX or HVX mode. Now what you'll see on this unit to mount is a speed mounting system which is designed by two adjustable nuts and a slide bar that simply slides into position when you're ready to mount onto a pan bar. So to mount this, you simply back this off a few turns. You'll actually simply slide this, moving the bar out of the way, directly over the pan bar, locking this knob directly across. And if you need to back off the nuts a little bit more, you'll actually do that, moving into position, and quickly rotating the two pieces up will actually mount the zoom remote into position. Now you want a firm lock because if you actually are operating the rocker switch, you do not want the zoom remote to move. So here and now we have a clean, nice fit. The important thing to remember is making sure that the rocker switch does not come in contact with the grip pad on the pan bar. Otherwise you will get resistance or you'll get a sticking zoom movement. Now one of the things you'll notice on this controller is that there are three separate buttons located on the face of the unit. Now each of these buttons only work in certain functions. For instance, all three buttons will be usable when you're in the LANC protocol. When you're in the HVX protocol, only the center button will operate. Now, to show you what the buttons do, the first button here that you see is designed to actually turn your camera on or off. Now, this will also allow you to put your camera into standby as well. And it's used in conjunction with an LED that's mounted directly above it. Next is the center button, which is what we use for the record function. The record function actually will also be accompanied by a red LED that lights up when recording on the top. The third button here is a mode switch button or a focusing button. This actually operates in lag mode several different features. One is if you actually press this down for longer than a second, it's like accessing the push auto function on the side of the camera. If you press this twice, it'll actually toggle the camera between manual focus and auto focus. Now these functions are only available depending on if it's been programmed into the camera manufacturer's protocol. For instance, in Sony cameras, it's guaranteed to work. In Canon cameras, it only works in certain cameras. The power on off button gives you a couple of different features. When the LED light actually is on, there's two types of modes that you'll see. There's a flashing green and then there's a solid green. Now the solid green indicates that you're actually powered on and the camera is ready to operate. Now, if you see a flashing green, it means one of two things. The flashing green, when it first starts up, means it's actually loading onto the camera in the length mode, meaning it's like a software boot. You're plugging into the camera and loading the program into it. However, if the solid green begins to flash to a flashing green from normal operation, that also indicates that your actual battery level is starting to drop. And that, again, is only featured in certain cameras. The red LED button, when lit, indicates that you're actually recording. It'll show you a solid red. However, when the red LED starts to flash, it actually indicates either you have no tape present or you've actually reached the end of the tape that you've used in the camera. The yellow button, or the yellow LED, will indicate 
two different things. A solid yellow LED will indicate that the camera is put into autofocus mode. A non-lit LED indicates that the camera is in a manual focus mode. Now, in a flashing LED, means that you actually have the rocker switch controlling your focus. And that's engaged simply by pressing the button once quickly. Now, the other function it can do is when first booting up, meaning when you first power this on, and you actually hold down the focus switch and hold it for longer than three seconds, this will actually change the direction of which way it goes telephoto and which way it goes wide. And that's simply by holding this down at the boot point when you first turn on the camera. Now, these functions are only available when used in a LAMP protocol mode. For HVX functions or DVX functions, which is also known as a cam remote function, it just basically gives you the rocker switch for zooming and your record button. It is a very limited feature. You'll notice on the side also that there is a dial that's located on the side here. Now, this is actually for trimming your expansion or reduction of speed for how fast you want the rocker switch to control zoom, either tele or wide. Now, this is only, again, available in the LAMP mode. So basically, as you can see, there's a small arrow indicator that indicates your different types of speeds. The upper point indicates the slowest position. So if you actually press your walker all the way down, it'll only reach the slowest speed. As you adjust it variably, that will actually change the maximum speed when pressed all the way to the end. The first LED indication indicates a solid green. Now when the solid green is on, that indicates that the battery has full power and that the camera is actually on and operating. The second LED, when lit solid, indicates that you're actually in record mode. Now at certain times you'll notice that the actual LED flashes. When the, flat, when the flashing indicates that one, either you have no tape present in tra tape transport, or two, you've actually reached tape end. The third LED does multiple functions. This LED here, when lit solid yellow, indicates that the camera is in an autofocus mode. When you press twice, the LED is now off. This indicates that the camera is in manual focus mode. If you press once, the yellow indicating LED begins to flash to indicate that the rocker can now control focus. When pressed once again, it goes back to the previous state, either in manual or autofocus mode, depending on which light is set at. Now, when the camera first starts up, you'll notice that the green LED flashes. The green LED flashing indicates that it's going through a boot sequence and should not be touched before operating. Once solid green, that allows you to actually operate the unit. If you do find yourself that you've actually touched it before then, you want to turn off the camera and restart the camera again. Now, the reason why we say this is because if you do not allow it to calibrate properly, it'll actually cause the zoom to creep a little bit, either moving in or out, depending on the circumstances. Now, what you see also included into the system is a coiled cable. By coiling the cable, it allows a recoil effect, which will actually stretch or reduce itself to make sure that it stays out of the operator's way. One of the new products offered by Bebob is a Focus Iris controller designed for use with the DVX100B and the HVX200 series camcorders. Now, this unit was designed by Bebob to emulate the use of basically a follow focus control. Now, this came available mainly due to the fact that Panasonic introduced on their newer series of cameras a focus control port. Now, this unit actually gives you the same feel and function of a follow focus, but also integrating an iris slider that's located at the top it allows you to control the iris manually. On this, you'll see it actually has two surfaces, a white surface on the knob designed for marking your focus marks, and a white surface on the upper part of the body designed for marking your iris positions. Now, to operate the iris, you actually have a slider belt assembly, which actually slides the position of the indicator to the different focus markings, to the different iris markings. And on the knob itself, you notice that there's a white scale to indicate your focus marking. On the unit, you'll see there are four tabs located in 90 degree positions around the unit to help you orient depending on whether the focus controller is sitting horizontally, vertically, left or right, or from the top for your focus positions. 
On the back of the unit, you'll also notice two labels here. One indicates focus, the other indicates iris. When it's either located in positions, this indicates that you are in a manual position, indicated by the labels, so that you can actually control focus using the front knob of the control unit. When the switch is placed back to the auto position, this allows the camera to remain con in control of the focusing, with thus allowing you to put it back into autofocus. On the opposite side, you'll notice the same switch, but for the iris function. Now, pressing this down will actually put it in the manual position, which then allows you to control the iris manually. When you slide it in the upper position, it now controls it back to the camera, giving the camera auto iris control features. The mounting is similar in design to our zoom controls, and basically you have the speed knobs with a moving bar that will simply uh, clamp directly onto the rod of a 50 millimeter lightweight support or on the pan bar of a, of a tripod system. Included with a Foxy is a small bracket designed to slide onto 15 millimeter rods, which allows you for quick removing on and off from a 15 millimeter lightweight support as well. With the unit, features include a coiled cable, for operator convenience, for retraction and expansion, and then a 3.5 millimeter focus jack, which will only fit into the focus port of the Panasonic HVX200 or the DVX100B. The focus on the Fox is designed to give you over 260 degrees of rotation to maximize your focusing control capability. The Iris gives you almost full travel across the body to give you expanded features for iris positioning. Multiple position on the iris slider allowed to use it by the front thumb if for convenience, back thumb or directly on the top, depending on how you have the unit mounted. On the newer model of Foxy's, you'll, indicate, you'll notice a three-way sliding switch. And the reason for this is you'll find that one, the center position is for autofocus, meaning the camera controls your focus control, and the other two being for manual control. But depending on which position that you've mounted the manual control switch to, that will change the direction of which way the focus moves. Thanks for viewing this video today, and I hope you find it useful in helping you to create better shots. If you have any other questions or if you would like to discuss any problems or issues, please visit us or give us a call. Our website is www.16x9inc.com.